Okay, so all I want to do in, in Galatians 4 is just grab one verse. So if you're watching this on the video, make sure you also go back and watch the study around the same time period. It should be posted. Galatians 4. So we're studying the book of Galatians in the first hour. Galatians 4, 19 to 31 would be the name, the title of that study to watch. It goes with this hour that we're starting now. The verse I want to start with is verse 29. But as then he that was born after the flesh persecuted him that was born after the spirit, even so it is now. And of course, in the first hour, we learn that he that is born of the flesh is Ishmael, born of Sarah's handmaiden, Ishmael. He that was born of the spirit after the spirit is Isaac. And the Bible does call Isaac Abraham's only son. Hebrews says that. There are several other places where it says, even in Genesis we'll see later on where he says, take uh, thy son, thine only son, Isaac, up to um, sacrifice him. Okay, so even as far back in Genesis, the Bible is saying thine only son, and Ishmael still would have been walking the earth at that time. So kind of interesting, it's just, it's, we'll, we'll see that in the scripture as we go. Alright, so now you can let go of, you can let go of Galatians. I just wanted to make sure we, we caught that part, um, uh, I'm just going to read 29 again. But as then, he that was born after the flesh, persecuted, catch that word, he persecuted him that was born after the spirit, even so it is now. And I would suggest to you, even so, it is now in the year 2014. All right, Galatian, or Genesis now. I get this, George. Galatians. Genesis chapter 16. Let's look at this passage. Actually, before we start 15, the Catch the Land passage. Jerry, this will go to you, your questions in the first hour. In chapter 15, in chapter 15, starting in verse 18, in the same day the Lord made a covenant with Abram. By the way, notice his name here is Abram. It's not yet changed to Abraham. Just like there is a guy in the New Testament, Saul, whose name gets changed to Paul. How about that? In this, verse 18, In the same day the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, Unto thy seed have I given this land from the river of Egypt unto the great river of the river Euphrates. Uh, the Kenites and the Ken Kenizzites and the Cadonites and the Hittites and the Perizzites and the Raphims and the Amorites and the Canaanites and the Gigerishites and the Jebusites all right, now, the land. And so it began way back here, Genesis 12. It's been all about the land. Where did Moses take the people? To the promised land, right? I mean, you even saw when Mo the basketball player, Moses uh, Malone. You know, Moses, take us to the promised land. Of course, they're meaning the, the NBA championship when they were saying that. But it was all about the land, the promised land. And the promise throughout time. All right. Now, chapter 16, verse 1. Now Sarah, Abram's wife, bare him no children, and she had a handmaid, an Egyptian, who's, so there you see, her handmaid is an Egyptian. The Bible told you that right there in 16.1. An Egyptian, whose name was Hagar. And Sarah said unto Abram, Behold, now the Lord hath restrained me from bearing. I pray thee, go in unto my maid, it may be that I, obtain, I may obtain children by her. And Abram hearkened to the voice of Sarah. And, and, and I may be saying the names right because Sarah's name gets changed to Sarah when Abram's name gets changed to Abraham. Sarah, I mean, how can I... I'll say Sarai for now just to make the distinction, okay? Because her name does get changed. Uh, so verse 4, And he went in unto to Hagar, and she conceived. And when she saw that she had conceived, her mistress was despised in her eyes. 
And Sarai said unto Abram, My wrong be upon thee, I have given my maid into thy bosom. And when she saw that she had conceived, I was despised in her eyes. The Lord judge between me and thee. But Abram said unto Sarai, Behold, thy maid is in thy hand. Do to her as it pleaseth thee. And when Sarai dealt hardly with her, she fled from her face. Now watch who speaks to to Hagar. And the angel of the Lord found her by a fountain of water in the wilderness, by the fountain in the way to Shur. And he said, Hagar, Sarai's maid, whence camest thou, and whither wilt thou go? And she said, I flee from the face of my mistress Sarai. And the angel of the Lord said unto her, Return to thy mistress, and submit thyself unto her hands. And the angel of the Lord said unto her, And watch these promises, I'm going to say promises, that are now made to Ishmael through Hagar. All right, but watch the promises made here. Uh, verse 10, And the angel of the Lord said unto her, I will multiply thy seed exceedingly, that it shall not be numbered for multitude. And the angel of the Lord said unto her, Behold, thou art with child, and shalt bear a son, and shalt call his name Ishmael, because the Lord hath heard thy affliction. And watch how it describes Ishmael now in verse 12. And remember how he started with that verse in Galatians chapter 4 that we read it. Okay? Verse 12. And he will be a wild man. His hand will be against every man, and every man's hand against him. And he shall dwell in the presence of all his brethren. And she called the name of the Lord that spake unto her, Thou God seest me. For she said, Have I also here looked after him that seeketh me? Wherefore, and, and on it goes here, uh, 15, And Hagar bare Abram a son. Abram called his son's name, which Hagar bare, Ishmael. And Abram was fourscore and six years old when Hagar bare Ishmael to Abram. Okay, so chapter 16 is that story. And notice that already it's promised that through Ishmael, his seed will be exceeding, verse 10, thy seed exceed, I'll multiply thy seed exceedingly. Don't miss that. Okay, and he's going to be a wild man. And his seed will be against all other men. Um, all other men. All right, verse 12 there. And he'll be a wild man. His hand will be against every man. And every man's hand against him. And he shall dwell in the presence of all his brethren. Okay, just stay tuned. It'll come into play here as this, this story develops and this time develops. Now, chapter 17. And when Abram was 90 years old and nine, so 13 years later, right? The Lord appeared to Abram and said unto him, I am the Almighty God, walk before me and be thou perfect. And I will make my covenant between me and thee and will multiply thee exceedingly. And Abram fell on his face and God talked with him saying, As for me, behold, my covenant is with thee and thou shalt be a father of many nations. Neither shall thy name any more be called Abram, but thy name shall be called Abraham. For a father of many nations have I made thee. Now, as we're going to see, watch, watch what Abraham's thinking. Anyway, and I will make thee exceeding fruitful, and I will make nations of thee, and kings shall come out of thee. Okay, promises being made to Abraham. Now Abraham. And I will, verse 7, I will establish my covenant between me and thee and thy seed after thee in their generations for an everlasting covenant to be a God unto thee and to thy seed after thee. And I will give unto thee, again singular, unto thee, Abraham, and to thy seed after thee, the land. Here's the promise of the land. Jerry, just with you, your question from the first hour. I said it'll, it'll come more into play in the second hour. Here it is, the promise. It, under, you know, cap, or highlight this verse, verse 6 of chapter 17. Excuse me, verse 8. I'm going to start again from the beginning. I will give unto thee and to thy seed after thee 
the land wherein thou art a stranger, all the land of Canaan, for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. So there it is. And so starts from right here. Genesis 7, I'm saying this is a start, it's already been promised, but from at least from Genesis 17, 8, all the way through, they're looking for that land. Okay, they're, they're looking for the land, they're looking for the land. When the Lord Jesus Christ comes to earth, what are those Jews looking for? Him to be king over this land that 17, 8 is talking about. That's one of the reasons the Jews crucify him when they say, wait a minute. He's not that king, that earthly king that we were looking for. We Jews are looking for an earthly king over the land Canaan, the land of Canaan. So they have him crucified. Of course, we know, as 1 Corinthians 2 says, it was a mystery so that they would crucify him so that he would die for our sins and take our sins to hell and be raised again on the third day for our justification. He paid the penalty we deserve so that we can have eternal life by just trusting in the gospel of Christ. Okay? But, back here in time now. So now we're in verse 9. And God said unto Abraham, Thou shalt keep my covenant, therefore thou and thy seed after thee in their generations. This is my covenant, which ye shall keep between me and you and thy seed after thee. Every man child among you shall be circumcised. And so begins the, the token, verse 11. And ye shall circumcise the flesh of your foreskin, and it shall be a token of the covenant betwixt you and me. And he that is eight days old shall be circumcised among you. Every man child in your generations, he that is born in the house or bought with money, of any stranger which is not of thy seed. He that is born in thy house and he that is bought with thy money must needs be circumcised. And my covenant shall be in your flesh for an everlasting covenant. And the uncircumcised man child whose flesh of his foreskin is not circumcised, that soul shall be cut off from his people. He hath broken my covenant. Okay, and that continued all the way through. And why in Galatians where we're getting to Chapter 5, it's going to be all about cir circumcision again. You know, we've already seen some about circumcision. That's the issue going on back. <coughs> Even jump ahead 17, 1800 years to, to where the book of Galatians is written in Acts 16, 17 in there. Circumcision's the main issue. And they're tracing <coughs> it back here to Acts chapter 17. Okay, this covenant that's made between God and Abraham and the seed of Abraham. It's continuing clear to that day. Alright, questions on that first of all before we go further. That's, okay, yes. That was interesting that Ishmael has been circumcised. Yep. Yes. And that's exactly what he's going to do here. So, verse 15. And God said unto Abraham, As for Sarai thy wife, thou shalt not call her name Sarai, but Sarah shall, be, shall her name be. And I'll bless her, and give thee a son also of her. Yea, I will bless her, and she shall be a mother of nations. Kings of people shall be of her. Just like he had said back to Abraham a few, Abram a few chapters ago. Verse 17, Then Abram fell upon his face and laughed, and said in his heart, Shall a child be born unto him that is a hundred years old? And shall Sarah, that is ninety years old, bear? And Abraham... So that was in his heart, right? Don't miss, that was in his heart. Um, 18, And Abraham said unto God, Oh, that Ishmael might live before thee. Whoa. And God said, Sarah, thy wife, shall bear thee a son indeed, and thou shalt call his name Isaac. And underline the next phrase, I will establish my covenant with him for an everlasting covenant and with his seed after him. All right, make no mistake. Isaac is the father of God's chosen people. Well, Abraham is. 
through Isaac in that lineage. There are groups of people today, as we're going to find later on, that believe it is through Ishmael. Look at the next verse, 20. And as for Ishmael, I have heard thee. Behold, I have blessed him. Here is Ishmael's blessing. He does have a blessing, and here it is in your Bible. Behold, I have blessed him, and will make him fruitful, and will multiply him exceedingly. Twelve princes shall he beget, and I will make him a great nation. Does that sound like anybody else you know of in the Bible? <laughs> the Jews. What does it go back to? The twelve patriarchs. Satan is the great imitator, and that imitation comes right through, starting you know, back here in Genesis. Everything that God the Father has done, Satan has mimicked, has imitated. It's amazing. They're just, they're parallel, right through. And it's going to continue. Out there in the trip, halfway through, there's going to be a man that's slain, and he's going to be raised from the dead. And guess how many days he's going to be dead? Three. Can you think of anybody else that was dead for three Three days in the grave? Yeah, the Lord Jesus Christ. But then he was raised on the third day. You think people, and you wonder why people are going to follow that man in the trip. When he's raised from the dead after three days, there he is. There's Christ. I'm sorry? Anti yeah, and it's, he's the Antichrist, exactly, as your Bible calls him. But that's one of the reasons people are going to follow him. They're going to think he is the Christ. Be amazing. Satan's got serious power. Uh, so the end of verse 20, I'll make him a great nation. But my covenant will I establish with Isaac, which <clears throat> Sarah shall bear unto thee at this set time in the next year. And he left off talking with him, and God went up from Abraham. Um, Abraham took Ishmael, his son, all that were born in his house. Uh, they're going to circumcise them. Verse 25, Ishmael, his son, was 13 years old when he was circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin. Now, I'm amazed how the Jews take Ishmael's 13th. They have a whole rich religious ritual based around when a young Jewish boy turns 13. It's called a bar mitzvah. They do it to this day. It's when he's 13. You know, and that traces back to Ishmael, not to Isaac. I don't know why, just for what it's worth. Uh, okay, so in the selfsame day was Abraham circumcised and Ishmael his son. And all the men of his house, born in the house and bought with money of the stranger, were circumcised with, with him. Okay, now we want to jump ahead. Come down to verse 9 of chapter 18. So they said unto him, Where is Sarah thy wife? And he said, Behold, in the tent. And he said, I will certainly return unto thee according to the time of life. And lo, Sarah thy wife shall have a son. And Sarah heard it in the tent door which was behind him. Now Abraham and Sarah were old and well stricken in age. And it ceased to be with Sarah after the manner of women. Therefore Sarah laughed within herself, saying, After I am waxed old, shall I have pleasure, my Lord being old, old also? And the Lord said unto Abraham, Wherefore did Sarah laugh, saying, Shall I of surety bear a child which am old? Is anything too hard for the Lord? You might want to underline that phrase right there too. Is anything too hard for the Lord? A man of a hundred, a woman of ninety, can bear a child because the Lord causes it to be so. I guess there's nothing too hard for the Lord to accomplish. Proof right there. Verse 14, at the time appointed, I will return unto thee according to the time of life, and Sarah shall have a son. Then Sarah denied, saying, I laugh not, for she was afraid. And he said, Nay, but thou didst laugh. And the men rose up from thence and looked toward Sodom and Abraham. 
uh, went away with them to bring them on the way. And the Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham that thing which I do? And seeing that Abraham shall surely become great and a, become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. For I know him. And, and by the way, fathers, watch this verse 19. And you fathers, watch verse 19. Great, great advice for fathers here. Great example for fathers to follow. For I know him, that he will command his children and his household after him, and they shall keep the way of the Lord to do justice and judgment that the Lord may bring upon Abraham that which he has spoken of him. That's just a great example, fathers, for us to follow. Verse 20, and the Lord said, because the cry of Sodom and Gomorrah is great, because their sin is grievous, on and on. Okay, I'm going to skip all the next to the Sodom and Gomorrah story. Uh, chapter 19, verse 1, and there came two angels to Sodom and Eve, and I want to skip that. Uh, Come to chapter 21. Chapter 21. And the Lord visited Sarah as he had said, and the Lord did unto Sarah as he had spoken, for Sarah conceived and bare Abraham a son in his old age. And at the, did I give you the right reference? 21 verse 2. And at the time of which God had spoken of him. And Abraham called the name of his son that was born unto him, whom Sarah bare to him, Isaac. And Abraham circumcised his son Isaac, being eight days old, as God had commanded him. And Abraham was a hundred years old when his son Isaac was born unto him. And Sarah said, God has made me to laugh, so that all that hear will laugh with me. And she said, Who would have said unto Abraham, that Sarah should have given children suck, for I have borne him a son in his old age. And the child grew and was weaned, and Abraham made a great feast the same day that Isaac was weaned. And Sarah saw the son of Hagar. Now, now we're going to get back to this thing, and it's really what this study really is about. Uh, what time do you have, please, anybody? 11.50. Thank you. Wow. Thank you. Here's really what the study is about. Ishmael and Isaac, and here we go. And Sarah saw, verse 9, And Sarah saw the son of Hagar, the Egyptian, which she had borne, which she had borne unto Abraham, mocking. Wherefore she said unto Abraham, Cast out this bondwoman and her son. Does that sound like a phrase we read in the first hour? Cast out the bondwoman and her son. For the son of this bondwoman shall not be heir with my son, even with Isaac. You know, the allegory that's going on right here, right? As we read in, in Galatians chapter 4, the allegory. And the thing was very grievous in Abraham's sight because of his son. And God said unto Abraham, Let it not be grievous in thy sight because of the lad and because of thy bondwoman. In all that Sarah hath said unto thee, hearken unto her voice. And underline the next rest of the verse, for in Isaac shall thy seed be called. Remember that phrase. Your Bible says, For in Isaac shall thy seed be called. <clears throat> and also of the son of the bondwoman will I make a nation, because he is thy seed. So he is his seed. And Abraham rose up early in the morning, took bread and a bottle of water, and gave it unto Hagar, putting it in her shoulder and the child, and sent her away. And she departed and wandered in the wilderness of Beersheba. And the water was spent in the bottle, and, and she cast the child under one of the shrubs. And she went and sat, up, and sat her down over against him a good way off, as it were a bow shot. For she said, Let me not see the death of the child. She thinks he's going to die. They're going to starve to death. And she sat over against him and lifted up her voice and wept. And God heard the voice of the lad, and the angel of God called to Hagar out of heaven. You see that. And the angel of God called to Hagar out of heaven and said unto her, What aileth thee, Hagar? Fear not, for God hath heard the voice of the lad where he is. Ishmael's promise, verse 18, Arise, lift up the lad, and hold him in, the, hold him in thine hand, for I will make him a great nation. And God opened her eyes, and she saw a well of water, and she went and filled the bottle with water and gave the lad drink. 
And God was with the lad, and he grew and dwelt in the wilderness and became an archer. And he dwelt in the wilderness of Paran, and his mother took him a wife out of the land of Egypt. She was an Egyptian, so is Ishmael's wife, right? Okay, so this goes on. Now, verse or chapter 22. This is going to be the test of Abraham's faith, where he's told to, to sacrifice Isaac. Because I want you to see what the Bible calls Isaac, a key phrase here. So everybody's clear what's happened at this point. Right? Okay, we've got Ishmael, we've got Isaac. They both have promises of great seed. Nations will come from both of them. Twelve kings are going to come from Twelve princes will come from both of them. All right, we have parallel lineages going on. And they do start with Abraham. Abram. Now Abraham, chapter 22, verse 1, And it came to pass after these things that God did tempt Abraham and said unto him, Abraham, and he said, Behold, here am I. And he said, Take now thy son, underline the next four words, thine only son Isaac. Those are the words of God Almighty. Don't ask me why. It's his words. That's what he says. Could that mean that uh, don't take? Ishmael. Take now thine son, thine only son Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah, and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains, which I will tell thee of. Okay, so he goes on, and you know the story of, and of course the story of, of Isaac, of Abraham, He's going to, to sacrifice Isaac, and at the last minute, the angel of the Lord stops him. He's about to put the knife right into his heart. And the angel of the Lord stops him, and he provides a lamb. You know, actually, while we're here, just a couple verses. Uh, so verse 2, so verse 3, Abraham rose up early in the morning, saddled his ass, took two of his young men with him, and Isaac his son, clave the wood for the burnt offering. So you know a burnt offering has already been instructed. You know, so they, they're following what they've been told to do, a burnt offering. And rose up, went unto the, the place of which God had told them. Then on the third day, hmm, a little foreshadowing there, on the third day Abraham lifted up his eyes, saw the place far off, and Abraham said unto his young men, Abade, here, abade ye here with the ass, <clears throat> And I and the lad will go yonder and worship and come again to you. And Abraham took the word, the wood of the burnt offering and laid it upon Isaac his son, a foreshadowing the son taking the cross, the wood, upon his shoulders, just as Christ did. The burnt offering and laid it upon Isaac his son. And he took the fire in his hand and a knife, just like the sword. And they went both of them together. And Isaac spake unto Abram his father, and said, My father. And he said, Here am I, my son. And he said, Behold the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? So we know, you know, go back to the story in Genesis 3 or, or 4 and 5, when um, Cain and Abel, their offerings that the Lord had respect unto Abel and his offering, but not unto Cain, because Cain brought of the first fruits of the ground. Abel brought the first fruits of his flock. A burnt offering obviously was told to them, just as it is here. Here's the first time we see the mention of a lamb, though, okay? Um, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? And Abraham said, My son... God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. And up they go, verse 12, at the end there. I know that thou fearest God, seeing thou hast not, only, hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, from me. So once again, thine only son. We see it there again. Hebrews eleven seventeen. if you want to put a footnote there for yourself, would also say, thine only son, or his only son, Isaac. Okay, now, the reason I'm doing a lot of this. So clear back here, Genesis 12, we have two, two religious, I'll call them, groups. 
So we have Abraham. We have Isaac. And the Jewish nation comes from that. We have Ishmael. And we have a Muslim nation that to this day, you know, they trace themselves right back to Ishmael. They trace themselves right back to Abraham. Okay? Or Islam, if that's a better way to say that. Muslim, Islam. Okay? They trace it right back. Those two parallel. Right through. Those two both have 12 um, princes that are going to come. Um you know, from back here, that, that will come in the future. A promise made to both is, you know, that, that the seed of Ishmael would exceeding, exceedingly multiply, just as it was promised to Abraham through Isaac, that the Jews would exceedingly multiply. Okay, now he also said, I'll bless them that bless thee, curse them that curse thee, and through the seed of Isaac. But today we have two parallel groups going on, and gang, this thing is coming fast and hard to this country. You know, it's been going on for thousands of years, but it's really coming to this country hard now. And it's, it's amazing that we're in Genesis 4, and the allegory that was our subject for today. Uh, and actually, I want to read that first. Thing. I'm going to go back to Genesis 4, Galatians 4. So our study of Galatians, verse by verse, I think we're done with Genesis. You can let go there. Come back to Genesis 4 one more time. <laughs> wow. Thank you. Galatians 4. I'm just going to read about four or five verses in a row and then talk about it. So Galatians 4, starting in 21. Tell me, ye that desire to be under the law, do you not hear the law? For it is written... That Abraham had two sons, the one by a bondmaid, the other by a free woman, Hagar, Sarah. But he who was of the bondwoman was born after the flesh, Ishmael. But he of the free woman was by promise, Isaac. Which thing, verse 24, which things are an allegory? Allegory, using a literal historic event to make a spiritual application. So Galatians 4 is taking what we read, Genesis 12 through 21, the different parts in there. That was a, a literal historical event. Those literally happened. Here in Galatians, Paul is making an allegory, a spiritual application of what happened back there. But there's a literal application going on right now as well. Okay, verse 24, which things are an allegory? For these are the two covenants, the one from the Mount Sinai, which gendereth to bondage, which is Agar, and the law. For this Agar is Mount Sinai in Arabia, and she answereth to Jerusalem, which now is, and is in bondage with her children. But Jerusalem, which is above, is free, and is the mother of us all. Come down to verse 29. But as then he that was born after the flesh, Ishmael, Persecuted him that was born after the Spirit, Isaac. Even so, it is now. And my application to you now is, and even so is it now, in the year 2014, and it's coming to this country big time. Now, again, that's where we were, Galatians 4. We've been studying this for how many weeks? It just so happens that's where we were. And yesterday, here comes this email, and I've got to read this to you. By the way, the man that sent me this let me preach in the Baptist church here Wednesday night. I haven't even told you about that yet. And man, did that turn out to be a great study. Unbelievable. Yes, a Baptist church. But he sent this one. For your information, America. And the subject is, can Muslims be good Americans? Let me just read this. Let it say what it says. We want our children and grandchildren to understand this regarding Muslims. Question, can Muslims be good Americans? This is very interesting. We all need to read it from start to finish and send it on to everyone. 
Maybe this is why our American Muslims are so quiet and not speaking out about any of the atrocities going on. Can a good Muslim be a good American? This question was forwarded to a friend who worked in Saudi Arabia for 20 years. The following is his, is his reply, so make no mistake. This guy that lived in Saudi Arabia, it's his opinion, his reply. Theologically, no, a good Muslim cannot be a good American. No, he can't, because his allegiance is to Allah, the moon god of Arabia. By the way, if any of I went one time, okay, true confessions, I went one time to a Masonic temple. There was a guy that I knew well who was a Mason. He was whatever the top rank is. Poopaw. The Grand Poopaw. But when you go there, it is unbelievable. I mean, you'd swear you were walking into Arabia. And this is central Alabama. I mean, anyway, we don't need to go. Even the, the hats they wear, it's like you're going into Arabia. I mean, you, you really think that, and it's all based around that. But anyway, so, so Allah is the moon god of Arabia. Religiously, no, they can't, because no other religion is accepted by his Allah except Islam. And if you look in the Quran, 2 colon 256, it says that no other religion is accepted by Allah except for the religion Islam. Scripturally, Again, the question, can a Muslim be a good American? Scripturally, no, because his allegiance is to the five pillars of Islam and the Quran. Geographically, no, because his allegiance is to Mecca, to which he turns in prayer five times a day. Socially, no, because his allegiance to Islam forbids him to make friends with Christians or Jews. Politically, no, because he, he must submit to the mullahs, I hope I'm saying that right, M-U-L-L-A-H-S, parentheses, the spiritual leaders of Islam, who teach annihilation of Israel and destruction of America, the great Satan. Domestically, no, because he is instructed to marry four women and beat and scourge his wife when she disobeys him. Quran 4.34. Intellectually, no because he cannot accept the American Constitution since it is based on biblical principles and he believes the Bible to be corrupt. Philosophically, no, because Islam, Muhammad, and the Quran does not allow freedom of religion and expression. Democracy and Islam cannot coexist. Every Muslim government is either dictatorial or autocratic. And I think that one, all you got to do is look around the world. Um, you know, because Islam, Muhammad, and the Quran does not allow freedom of religion and expression. I have a friend from way back who was murdered. Do you, do you remember a month or two ago? I can't remember if we talked about it in this study or not. About two months ago in, in Afghanistan, there were three, um, I'll say, missionaries slash doctors that were killed. Remember hearing about that, reading about that? One of those was a friend of mine 50 years, literally 50 years ago. I mean, as a little kid, we, we went to the same church. And so, so no, he's not a good friend. I lost track of him 50 years ago, okay? And I didn't even put the name together or anything until my mother told me. But I remember his parents more so than him, very distinctly, because they were of... Um, um, what this I swear, very simply anyway the point is they, they were just they were always like the greeters of the church they're just very friendly people and the son was actually two years old, older than I am but he for six months for the past 20 years he's a doctor and he would go to Afghanistan and he's been doing this for years and he's been, he's been going different places in the world but for the last many years he spends six months over there and I was it Afghanistan? You, yeah. And um, anyway, he was one of the three that they murdered. Um, and here he was trying to help them as a volunteer, as a doctor. They helped their kids, you know, a missionary doctor. But because he was Christian, not Muslim, you know, he was, he was murdered. They, uh, okay, so back to this. So spiritually, no, because, oh, here's the next one. 
All right, so philosophically, no, because Islam, Muhammad, and the Quran does not allow freedom of religion and expression, and it doesn't. How many Christians are being murdered left and right today in Islamic countries? All right, now they should know that before going over there because of everything we just read here. I mean, it does, it, it's, it does not agree. That's what they're told to do. They, they are, it's just what they're told to do. Spiritually, no, because when we declare one nation under God, the Christian's God is loving and kind, while Allah is never referred to as Heavenly Father, nor is He ever called love in the Quran's 99 excellent names. I guess they have 99 names for Allah. I, but I, I don't know that part. Therefore, after much study and deliberation, perhaps we should be very suspicious of all Muslims in this country. They obviously cannot be both good Muslims and good Americans. You've got to be one or the other. But call it what you wish, it's still the truth. You'd better believe it. The more who understand this, the better it will be for our country and our future. The religious war is bigger than we know or understand. Footnote, the Muslims have said they will destroy us from within. So freedom is not free. The Marines want this to roll all over the U.S. Please don't delay until you send this on. Anyway, I just I found it interesting that I would just come the day before the study of Galatians 4 and the whole thing about uh, Ishmael versus Isaac. Go back, Ishmael's called a wild man. He'd be at enmity against the seed of, of Isaac and, and Abraham. Um, so the and it's an uh, offshoot of Isaac then? Yeah. Yes. Uh, yes. And Sarah, it was like kind of her decision. Well, no, wait a minute. That's what we were talking about during the break. So actually, if you go back further back to the flood, the Jews and the, you know, Jews, as you just asked me, are the Gentiles offshoots of Isaac? No. No. The Jews are the lineage of Isaac. No. Gentiles, not Jews, are not the lineage. If they blessed Israel, then they, that's how they would be counted as. Okay? I want to make sure I answer that question. Stop there. And then I was thinking, well, was Sarah's, was Sarah's decision that this came about? Because she never discussed it with her husband. She did not discuss it. She just said it. Seems like a couple other things. How about Jacob and Esau? Mama making a discussion, a decision there. It is interesting how those are used, and I don't want to. I'm not going anywhere with those. You don't want to do Mother's Day again. I'm just. It is a fact. That yes, the way you worded that, she just made that decision. Abraham sure didn't argue it, did he? Nope. Be right there. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Wait a minute, you want me to what? Stop before we get in trouble here. Uh, so, but but really, this this right here, and if you really look at. Now go out to end times. You know, a lot of people want to make today it's communism versus Christianity, and and it's and it's Catholicism versus Christianity. Um, maybe it's this war that began right here, because look at literally what is surrounding the land, which is what we've been reading here back in Genesis. It is Islamic and Muslim countries. I mean, take. I mean, what happened in? In Libya, what's happening in Egypt? Ukraine. You know, uh, now what? Yeah, and that whole thing about Ukraine right now, man, and the and the, the Muslims going into there and going into to Europe. But physically, Iran, Iraq, right around, and of course, the, the, I'll say one thing that's helping us out a little bit is there's an internal war going on within Islam, the Shiites and the. Sunni, Sunni, Sunnites, whatever. Okay, so they've got that internal war going on. But it's still all back to Allah, and, and it's just two facts. If you will, it's like... Two denominations. Baptists and Presbyterians, and just to pick two. You know, they're still... Yeah, okay, anyway, maybe I shouldn't have done that. Well, yeah, I'm just but wondering. two sects of Ishmael, that's, uh, of the Ishmael lineage. 
All right, and what they believe is to the right things that Allah would have and who should be the next priests, I'll call them, of, of the Islamic religions. But um, it, it is a war. It started back then. Question? What's the difference then with, with Isaac? Isaac is low am I? So they're really, you can erase that whole line. Well, so today, today. that would be true because today there is no difference. Yeah. Bond nor free. But there is these the people, bottom line. These people, Gentiles, all get saved the same way. It's by the gospel of Christ. When this dispensation is over and it goes back to Jews, this war is sitting right up for the end of the trip. I mean, there's your war right there. I guess when there's I was, your battle of Armageddon yeah. right there. I guess what I was getting at is that top line doesn't even exist on Isaac. Which you can Isaac, you can erase Isaac line. because God is blessing now. It seems to be Ishmael through Ishmael. I'm not saying Israel. Why would you say God is blessing through Ishmael? Well, God was with the lad. When did he not go there with the lad? There is no way God is blessing through Ishmael today. I'm talking about population. Populous. The world. The whole well, talk world. two different things up. But don't say God is blessing through Ishmael. There's I'm just no saying way that what God, God put in motion, that the population of Ishmael is evidently far exceeding that of What's happening with Isaac? That I don't know population numbers, so I don't know how to answer that. Um, are they, are they meaning the Islamics, the, the Islams, populating greater? I believe that they are at a faster rate. Yes. So continue that trend. There will, if it's not now, there certainly would be. Yeah, um, but I would not. That is not God blessing. Not blessing. Well, I was just looking Those at it, in, separate. in Genesis twenty one twenty. God was with the lad. Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, He already said, "I'm going to bless through this lad." But He also, He no, no, no. He didn't say bless. Well, he did not say bless. Multiply. Thank you. That's the key. Multiply. I'll bless yes. here. I will exceedingly yeah. multiply yeah. here. Multiply. And your seed will be against that seed. That is my. But the top. Seed. But the top row. So there, please with, get it right. Right. But the it top row. The top row is gone. It doesn't even exist. Yeah. yeah. That became a religion that just was this, totally. This being the top. It, it became being. a huge. Because religion. the Jews become the lamb. I remember in Acts twenty-eight. Not my people. Today. There is no difference, bond nor free, Jew nor Gentile, circumcised nor uncircumcised. Right. Those two lines are without the knowledge okay. of the mystery. And so yeah. that top line things. would be in existence if the mystery wasn't here and it would just continue on. And those, yeah, so it's an interruption, it's a mystery period, but when the rapture happens, these two lines come right back in again. These will be the two lines again. They're just interrupted right now, okay? So basically, well, so you see that happen. wouldn't it be back to Jews and Gentiles, and not specifically? Okay, it I mean, would be I'll back to the same. The church, which is the body of Christ, is out of here. So we're out of here, and that's right. that's what we know absolutely positively for sure. Right, but who would be left? Jews and Gentiles, yeah. but specifically Muslims. Muslims are Gentiles, correct? Right. Yeah. Muslims are Gentiles, correct? Because they're not Amen. Jews. I know I missed a lot. I'm sorry. Amen. That's all I was saying. They are Gentiles. Is it take the one? Oh, well, you never we'll, said that. We'll cut that. We'll cut you that. said they were blessing. That was God blessing. Yeah, they're Gentiles. Absolutely, they're Gentiles. And what I meant when I said blessing, their seed is far exceeding. <laughs> their seed is far exceeding. I don't know if it is yet, but it probably will at some point. You could count the Jews in this All right, world. so enough of that for now. <laughs> The point is today, it is a dispensation of the grace of God. I've gone way over. It's been great. I know. Today, it's one gospel, the gospel of Christ. We're all saved that same way. Christ died for our sins, for our sins. Was buried and raised again for our justification. All right. Thanks. Cut.